that way. Great to see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. God bless you. Thank you. All of you standing scared the daylights out of me. I thought you were leaving. Oh, half of you are. Do you know how tough it is to follow Jeff Foxworthy and Michael Reagan, for heaven's sakes? Please. I, I was uh, lieutenant governor in Arkansas back in 1994, and I won election in a special election in 1993. And because it was a special election, I had to turn around and run again in 94. And I was in a little town called Mountain View, Arkansas, up in the Ozarks, a beautiful little community that has this big festival every summer called the Ozark Folk Festival. And so I had gone up there to campaign like every other politician in the state. And you have to understand that in Arkansas, it was one of the most democratic states in the country. I mean, when I became governor, there were only 11 out of 100 House members who were Republican in the House, four out of 35 senators who were Republican. So I'm already a minority, and I was the, only the fourth Republican elected to a statewide office in 150 years. So I'm up there campaigning, and this is an area that is pretty hardcore Democrat, Stone County. And I'm shaking hands and getting a pretty good response and feeling rather good about it. And I saw this guy, and he's standing over by his truck, basking in the sun, wearing some bib overalls. I thought I'll go over there and talk to him. So I went over and put my hand out and said, Sir, I'm Mike Huckabee. I hope I'm going to have your vote for lieutenant governor. He said, Well, partner, you're going to get my vote all right, because that guy we got down there now, he ain't worth a darn. <laughs> now, I thought hey, maybe he was just unaware that I was that guy down there. And I looked at his face, and I realized he wasn't kidding. He was as serious as he could be. Now, what do you say to a guy who has just told you you weren't worth a darn? I'll tell you what I told him. I just said, well, sir, uh, I, I tell you what, I appreciate you're going to vote for me. And I want to tell you something. You're right about that guy we got down there now. He ain't worth a darn. I don't know if you remember this, but it was three years ago this month, April of 2008, when Barack Obama stood in San Francisco and he made the infamous comment in which he said about folks like us, that they get bitter and they cling to their guns and religion. Well, I want you to know I stand here tonight as a gun clinger and as a God clinger unapologetically. And I want you to know something. Probably like many of you, my father also was a gun clinger, and his father was a gun clinger. And I don't know if you've recognized this or not, but the father of our country, George Washington, was somewhat of a gun clinger. In 1792, he signed the Militia Act. I don't know if the president's ever read this, but he might ought to, because the Militia Act said that every male at the age of 18 was not permitted to own a gun, but was required to own a gun and some ammunition and a knapsack. I'm afraid today the president might only let us hold a knapsack. It's a shame, and I think our founders would be stunned to find out that today we have to go to the courts and the Congress and the state capitals and the city halls of America to demand and, if not beg, for the fundamental right that our founders gave us when they wrote the Bill of Rights upon which our very freedom stands. And there's one good reason that we still have some of those freedoms. And it's three words, N-R-A. Thank God the NRA is standing on our behalf and like so many of you, I find that my membership to the NRA does something very extraordinary. It makes it possible that someone else is sitting in all those boring meetings in Washington monitoring the nonsense so I don't have to go up there and monitor it. And if you've ever thought about it, your membership is worth its weight in gold because if it weren't for the NRA on your behalf and my behalf, we would have to go up there and personally keep an eye on every one of the thousands and thousands of pages of legislation that's being proposed by Congress. We don't have to do that, 
because we are making it possible that the NRA will look at it, let us know about it, so we can raise holy heck about it when we find out that they're trying to do something to infringe upon the Second Amendment rights of Americans like us. We are here tonight to celebrate America and to celebrate its values. And let me just say that one of the values that we cherish in this great country of ours is the value of being able to own firearms. But I want to be clear tonight that I am a hunter, but the Second Amendment is not about hunting. I was out in West Texas turkey hunting last week with country singer Aaron Tippin and the president of the NWTF, Jim Hinkle. We had a great time. I'm proud to say we all bag birds. But I'm here to tell you that as much as I love to hunt turkey and deer and duck and an occasional antelope and other things, I'm one that recognizes that the Second Amendment was not given to us to provide for and to protect a hobby or a sport. Uh, let's be clear. The Second Amendment is no more about simply protecting the sport or the hobby of hunting any more than it is about supporting and protecting the sport of football. Now, I know that that would be even more precious to some Americans than hunting. But my point is, the Second Amendment is about preserving our freedom. And without the freedom to make our own decisions as to what is right, what is wrong, and what we will do with our own families, it's not just hunting that we lose. I want us to be reminded that desperate people do desperate things. Civilization is an essence of an ear, and about 72 hours where people don't have food and, and they don't have water, and they have too much hot or too much cold, they can turn into people who are living by the law of the jungle. And I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but the reality is this, that in a time when people decide that they are going to break the law in order to get what they want, and they stand on your property and threaten your provisions and your family, it's one thing to say, get off my land, but it sure is a lot more effective when you're standing behind a 12-gauge or a Glock 40. It makes a heck of a lot of difference, and your voice gets a lot louder at that particular moment. One of the great ironies of the last year has been that President Obama actually got an F from the Brady Bunch. I'm not kidding. I'm not making this up because I believe that they thought his election would mean that every last firearm in America would be ground up by a great big metal saw and the pieces done away with in some salvage yard somewhere. But they gave him an F. And I want you to understand, they did not give him an F because he is secretly going to gun shows. And they did not give him an F because he sits up at night with a flashlight under the covers, quietly reading American Rifleman. <laughs> they gave him an F because he has not been as effective as they expected him to be. And the reason that he hasn't been is because of those of you in this room and the people like Wayne LaPierre and others, Chris Cox, and the many people at the NRA who work every day on our behalf to make sure that our basic fundamental rights as Americans are not taken from us. And thank God for that. We celebrate tonight another great American value, and that's the American value of our families. I was trying to explain to a reporter before I came out here earlier this evening what this atmosphere was like. I said, it, it's hard to describe, but this is real microcosm of America. It's not just a family of gun owners. It is a family of patriots, of people who don't necessarily love guns per se, but they love America. And that's what binds people in this room together. But one of the things that probably bind many of us together is the fact that our experience with firearms started with our own families. Most of us were taught to handle and to use a firearm by a parent. In my case, it was my dad. I, I think I'm speaking for many of us when I say that my greatest fear was never of a gun. My greatest fear was my father if I ever misused a firearm. That would be the worst thing that could ever happen to me. Because he raised me to understand that this was not a toy, and we always treated the firearms with the respect as if it were loaded at all times. 
And I really mean when I say that I was afraid of my father, partly because my father was the ultimate American patriot. Now let me explain patriotism as my father practiced it. He laid on the stripes and I saw the stars. <laughs> Old-fashioned patriotism did my father give. I learned to hunt with an old 16-gauge shotgun that he got from Sears that isn't worth a whole lot. In fact, the book that tells you how much it's worth is worth more than the shotgun would be today. As a kid, I collected pop bottles. Now, in the South, we call them Coke bottles, but then you think I'm talking about a brand. But, but I collected those, and I would turn them in for money. I don't know if anyone else has ever done that before, but that was about the only income I could get when I was eight years old. And I kept collecting pop bottles and would take them to the store and continue to keep my money until I was able to buy my first rifle, a Springfield single shot 22 that did a lot of squirrel hunting in South Arkansas. I got in a little trouble the last time I ran for president because I was on television and I told the story of being in the college dorm and I said we were not allowed to have any cooking devices back in the early 70s. This was before microwave ovens. The one thing for some reason which I'll never understand that they would allow us to have is a popcorn popper. Not a hot plate, not a stove, not a Coleman burner, but a popcorn popper. I never made popcorn in the darn thing. But I used to fry squirrel in the popcorn popper in my dorm room. <laughs> Honest to God, I did. And I told that story, and people thought, that man is some kind of a redneck. Folks, Jeff Foxworthy would have to love a guy that would fry squirrel in a popcorn popper in a dorm room in college. It's not you might be a redneck, folks. If you do that, you are a redneck. But let me tell you what I fear is that the idea that fathers would take their sons out in the woods and teach them not only how to use a firearm, but how to respect the life that was in those woods and how to understand that shooting is not for the purpose of killing, but it might be for the purpose of claiming food. And even then, you do it with the greatest respect and always obeying the laws and being a sportsman first and foremost and practicing it with safety. The fact that we have increasingly numbers of kids who grew up without a dad around is one of the things that ought to frighten us most about preserving and protecting our heritage, not only as hunters, but as owners of firearms and as freedom-loving Americans. Today, we as taxpayers spend $300 billion a year on the dad deficit. It's the amount of money that we spend as taxpayers to pick up the slack for the kids whose fathers have disappeared. And when I hear people say that the issues of family and marriage don't really matter because we need to focus on the economy, I agree we ought to focus on the economy. But let's focus on an economy that is robbing us as taxpayers blind because we have a lot of men who have irresponsibly abandoned their wives and their children and left the rest of us taxpayers with the responsibility of picking up the cost of doing what dads ought to honorably do. It is an economic issue. And if, and if we want to address poverty in this country, and we should, let us not forget that if two-thirds of the children in poverty in this country would no longer be in poverty if the mothers of those children were married to the fathers of those children. These are important issues that cannot be ignored if we're going to fix the economy of the United States of America. We celebrate tonight our values, which include, and foremost, our freedom. I believe this with all my heart. We don't just have a fiscal deficit in this country. We have a freedom deficit in this country. We need to recognize that the more that government takes from us, the less freedom we have, not just the less money. And we've somehow understood that if, if government took more money from us and higher taxes, that they're taking money. No, they're taking more than money. They're taking freedom. Because the money you have that you don't have anymore when government takes it for some nefarious purpose is your lack of freedom to spend it on your family like you want to, or to give it to your church, or to give it to a civic organization, or to donate it to the Red Cross for the hundreds of thousands of tornado victims that right now could use all of our help. 
And the fact is, when government takes something from us, they take more than something out of our pockets. They are taking something out of our power. Right now, the fight is not about government dollars, it's about government domination. It's not so much about the expense of government programs, it's whether they ought to exist at all. And that needs to be the new battle in the United States of America. I, for one, believe that Barack Obama's vision for America is wrong because his view of America is all wrong. His idea is that government can fix everything for us. Now, he's not alone in having this misguided perception. I was one of those people who believed that true conservatives were opposed to TARP and are opposed now to any government bailout where we are taxing increasingly the responsible small business owners of this country in order to take those funds and give them to the recklessly run big companies because we deem them too big to fail. That's like saying that many of you who run small businesses are too small to succeed. Well, the fact is the purpose of a government under our Constitution is to be the referee of the game, making sure that it's played fairly, but not to determine the outcome. When the guys in the striped shirts start wearing a team jersey, picking out one side to win and another side to lose, they have violated the purpose for which they have been given the striped shirts. And it's time to take the striped shirts away from them. And I say to those who believe that the government picks the car companies and the insurance companies and the banks that are going to win and the ones that are going to lose, the government has ceased to wear the striped shirt honorably, and it's time to take the shirts off of them. And if they want to wear a team jersey, let them get out in the private sector and prove that they are as good as they think they are every single day when they go to work. The freedom that we are losing today because of the economic problem is immense. I, I saw a, a young woman with two children in her car do something last week that stunned me, and I, I realized I was seeing a picture of what's happening and what's hurting in America. This young lady, and I don't know whether she was married or not or whether her husband was around, I don't know. I just know that she was at the gas pump and there were two kids in her car, and I was filling up my vehicle, and I happened to look over and I watched as she squeezed the handle on the, on the tank and she put $5 worth of gas in her car. $5. Not quite two gallons. And I looked at, as she did that, and then when she quit and put it away and got in her car and drove off, I realized the reason she put $5 worth of gas in her car was not because that's all that she needed. It's that's all she had. And she'd figure out when the next time she could gather another $5 and come back. I'm telling you, that our world... Is filled with folks like that who's in a world of hurt. The president's solution? Let him go buy a hybrid car. Brilliant idea, Mr. President. This lady can't afford five bucks of gas and you think she can afford a hybrid. It's time for a reality check. And part of that reality check is that we get back to a celebration of real American values. And it's not just being a gun clinger. I believe without any apology, it is also about being one who does cling to God. Because we are a nation blessed by God. I don't believe we would have ever existed without Him. And I don't believe that we will survive without Him. I look back at my own childhood. I, you know, I mean, I grew up in the days of Leave it to Beaver. If Leave it to Beaver were being created today, Wally and Eddie Haskell would be in a relationship as partners, not pals. I remember when the Gideons would give out Bibles, not school nurses giving out condoms to fifth graders. I remember when teachers strolled the halls with paddles, and we were scared to death of them. Today, we've got kids who show up with guns, and the teachers are scared to death of the kids. I remember when we prayed at school and we cursed in private. Today, we don't pray at all in school, and it's okay to curse in public. I'm not sure that we're better off. But I do know that the answer is not going to be found by continuing some of the ridiculous policies that rob us, again, not so much just of our firearms, but of our basic fundamental freedoms as Americans. Because some of us do understand that mothers and fathers raise better kids than governments ever will. And that's what we ought to be doing. I 
I've been in over 40 countries across the world. One country I've been to 15 times is Israel. My first time there was 1973 when I was all of 18 years old and just a couple of months before the Yom Kippur War. Over the years, I've gone back over and over again. I was just there two months ago. There's something about Israel that is always magnetic to me, in part because I recognize that it is one nation on earth that is most like us, created by people who escaped a galloping tyranny, hoping to find a sense of freedom and security for their families and their faith, and have been willing to put everything on the line to be free. I do not understand why our president today is more concerned about the Israelis building bedrooms for their own kids than he is about the Iranians building bombs that would be aimed at both the Israelis and at us. But it seems that he is. But this much I do know. There are lessons to be learned. And in 1994, in one of my trips to Israel, I took my children for the first time. My sons were teenagers, my daughter was 11, and just a few months shy of her 12th birthday. I always visited Yad Vashem when I go to Israel. It is the memorial dedicated to the victims of the Holocaust. I go there because it reminds me what happens when good and decent people sit down and look away when evil is happening in their presence. And it's a reminder of how, in the most sophisticated and scientifically advanced country on earth at the time, a maniacal leader was able to not only take power, but to solidify so much power and end up with the absolutely unfathomable goal of killing every last Jewish person on this earth. And he almost succeeded. And the Holocaust is such a powerful experience. I've never been there without weeping. I've never been able to go there without having a deep emotional impact from experiencing it. And I wanted my daughter to experience it, but she was 11, and I wasn't sure she was mature enough to handle just the gravity of the displays that would be at Yad Vashem. But my wife and I decided that she needed to see it. She needed to understand why people must get involved, why they must speak up and stand up, and never sit back and do nothing when the horrors are inflicted upon someone, whether they are our own families or someone else's. And so I took my daughter by the hand, and I was determined I would take her through. And if things got overwhelming for her, I would lead her out. But I hoped that she would be able to absorb this. I wanted her to get it. And as I took her through Yad Vashem, I took her as it's laid out in chronological form at that time. The first exhibits were those of the stars of David that were placed on children's clothing. Kids as young as five and six years old placed there, not so these kids could be elevated, but so they would be humiliated, isolated by their own peers. My daughter looked at that and she just couldn't imagine that somebody would do this to a kid as we continued through Yad Vashem. We came to the part of the exhibit depicting what happened in the Warsaw ghetto. Many of the parents hauled away in the middle of the night in the death trains. Children left to fend for themselves on the streets of Warsaw. Often the only food they would get would be some crumbs tossed from some sympathetic Polish family who knew that if they were caught giving those kids food, they would be on the next train to their own deaths. Kids in the winter only getting enough heat laying across the grate of a sewer. The Nazis made sport of the children by shooting them. We know they did it because they were so proud of what they were doing, they actually photographed themselves killing children. And the photos of those horrors displayed as a reminder of how cruel and evil people can become. And when we came to the part of Yad Vashem that told the stories of Dachau, Auschwitz, when the crematoriums could no longer hold the numbers of people who were being brought there for extermination, mass graves would be dug and thousands of Jewish people who just days before were shopkeepers and teachers and rabbis and musicians were stripped of their dignity and their clothing and paraded in front of one another naked on the way to the pits that had been dug. And as they got to the edge, they were shot in mass and then scraped off into the pits. So many bodies stacked upon other bodies that it no longer even looked like humanity. It looked like 
strips of lumber because there were so many of them. And all this time, I'm just praying, dear God, let my daughter understand what can so easily happen when people look the other way. When we came to the end of Yad Vashem, it was a guest book, and my daughter stepped up to it, and I stepped behind her, and I looked over her shoulder. I watched. She took a pen out of my pocket, and I, I stood over her shoulder, and I watched her write words I'll never forget. She first wrote her name and our address down in the little book, and then I looked, and I watched her as she paused because there was a place for comments, and I wondered if my daughter would say anything in that space, and if so, what? So I looked, and I watched, and I saw her take that pen, and in her childish 11-year-old scrawl, I saw her write these words that I shall not forget as long as I ever live. These were the words she wrote. Why didn't somebody do something? That's all she wrote there. Why didn't somebody do something? And with that, she put the pen back in my pocket, and we walked out, and she did not say another word for four hours. My daughter got married last year. She's now 28 years old. I've never had to ask her since that moment whether she got it. You will not find a spunkier little activist than my daughter. And I don't worry about her, but I sometimes worry about us. We were birthed by the greatest generation who gave everything so we would have a better life than they did. And God blessed them for it. And they deserve the term greatest generation. We cannot afford to be a generation that leaves our children with nothing but a huge debt and the very erosion of the freedoms that our founders and our fathers died and gave us so valiantly and that's why I say let there never be a time in this country where some father has to look over his daughter's shoulder and see her ask this haunting question, why didn't somebody do something? Because in this room, we are the somebodies, and we commit we will do something to preserve this great American heritage. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you.